Hello everybody, I'm Nick and in this video I'm going to show you how options validation or settings validation is changing in .NET 8. Now, .NET 8 in general has a push towards making .NET AOT or ahead of time ready. And if you don't know what AOT is, I do have a video on that in the channel. And one of those changes involve changing how we're doing options validation. So in this video, I'm going to show you what changed, how it will work, and how you can use it in your own code bases. If you like our content and you want to see more, make sure you subscribe for more training. Check out my courses on domtrain.com. All right, let me show you what I have here. And I'm going to start with a bit of a recap in case you do not know how options validation used to work. So I'm going to go into this example options object over here, which has effectively set mapped to it from the app settings.json. So we have the example section over here and then a log level. In my case, it is Nick, but it shouldn't. Realistically, this is a log level like information or warning or something like that. And then you have retries. Minus one is an invalid value, but let's say one retry is a valid value. And I want to restrict what type of values this object can take. If I want to do that, what I can say is things like this is a required parameter over here. But I can also say things like that this retries parameter needs to be in a certain range. So it has to be between one and nine. Now, just adding this doesn't really do anything. In fact, I can go ahead and just run this API over here and then call it from this calls.http object. And as you're going to see, everything just works. I'm getting log level null and then retries as zero. But how is that the case if I have a log level warning and retries one? Well, it's because you need to wire that thing up. And one of the ways to wire it up is to say builder.services and use the add options method over here. So I'm going to say add example options and bind them to a specific section. The section is config.getSection and I'm going to say example options dot section name. That's a generally good practice. Now, if I do that and I go ahead and I run the API again and I go ahead and I call that endpoint again over here, then you're going to see that everything is properly mapped. So retries one and warning. Now, a couple of things. If this log level needs to be part of an enum or within the range of an enum, then you can say enum data type over here and specify the type of log level in my case. So this also adds some sort of validation or boundaries to this parameter. However, this does not really kick in any validation by default. What you need to say over here, if you use this approach, is say validate data annotations. And with that, I'm going to change this to be out of bounds. So I'm going to say that retries actually is minus one, which is an invalid value. So if I go ahead and I run this and I go ahead and I call it again, it started fine. Nothing blew up on startup. But when I call it and just as a reminder, I am injecting this I options object. So I'm requiring it in this hello endpoint. Then and only then will this blow up and throw an exception and say that data annotation validation kicked in. The value is outside the bounds. It needs to be between one and nine. Now, what you could also do, by the way, is you can say that validate on start. And if you do that, as the name implies, when you run the application, your options will be resolved and validated in the start. So your application won't even start if one of those values are out of bounds. Very, very handy feature. If you just want to safeguard against some bad values that got in there for some reason, let's say your provider just didn't load properly and so on. However, this is done with reflection and everything around reflection on startup will cause your application to start slower. And the way .NET is moving is towards native AOT to shave off as much startup time as possible. So for that reason, what we got in .NET 8 is we got a brand new source generator that generates code to do this sort of validation on compile time. Let's take a look at how this would work and why, in my opinion, it is a bit clunky, like it could be designed better. But let's see how it works. So I'm going to remove all of these lines over here. I'm not going to use any of that. And I'm going to go to the example options object over here. And I'm going to create a separate class. And that will be a public partial class called example options validator. And this will implement the I validate options interface over here. Let me just make this a bit bigger for you. And in this parameter, we accept the example options object. And that is it. Now, if I just leave this as it is, it will say, hey, you have to implement the validate method over here that actually does the validation. But that defeats the purpose of having a source generator. So all you need to do here to have the generator kick in is use the options validator attribute. And the moment you add that, the error goes away 
And we can actually see over here that all of this code was generated based on the attributes given to the parameters in this example options object. Now the setup is a bit different. If you want to use this approach, what you want to do is go and say builder.services and use the configure method. And we're going to pass the example options object in here and then config.get section and pass in the section. So example options.section name. Here we go. But we also need to register this iValidate options because that sort of service or interface will need to be injected and used and registered. And for that to work, we have to say builder.services.add singleton in this case because we don't really need it to be anything else and have iValidate options of example options and then example options validator. And that is it. And the moment you do that, I can go ahead and say, run this API now. And when I call that endpoint over here, you see we get the exception, but all this is not based on this reflection sort of base code, but instead source generated and very, 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 very well optimized, which is one of the biggest benefits of having source generators, especially Microsoft written ones, because they will do their best to make sure they're as fast and as performant as possible. We see that constantly with how they keep improving the old ones, like the logging one as well. Now, this is not the only attribute we're getting. In fact, let's say that this retries option was actually a nested object and we had the example retries options over here and we say retries options and we have a separate class over here, example retries options and that has the parameter in it, then this means I have to go in here, make a top level object over here and then that object contains the retries. Now, if I do that and I went ahead and I tried to run this, then watch what happens. I'm going to go ahead and just stop it. I'm going to go ahead and just run it. And when I call that endpoint, this will actually work. We're not going to get an exception. That is because the option validation is only written for the top level object. So if you have nested objects, you have to use the very poorly named, in my opinion, validate object members attribute, which I don't like as a name, but it is what it is. I don't make the rules. So if you add that, then you let the validator know that, hey, there is something in here in this nested object you need to go ahead and validate. Of course, this means you're going to have to have a separate validator. So for that, I'm going to go ahead here and say example retry options validator, example retries options validator. I'm going to save that and that then will kick in. I'm going to go ahead and just run this. And if I do that and I call it, then you're going to have proper validation on the nested object as well. Now, the reason why I say the design is a bit weird and I can hear both parties, by the way, talking about this, but I would like the options object to sort of control in a way how it is going to be validated. So I would like for this to be the partial class and have the validation related stuff in here. Now, would that be too convoluted? I don't know. I do believe that having separate classes makes you jump in different locations or files to see what has a validator, what doesn't have a validator. And ultimately, all of these will look the same. You just have a partial class that implements the exact same interface with the exact same type. Do we really need so many different classes? That's one of the biggest, in my opinion, design flaws of sort generators. You have this magic attributes that you don't really know what they do unless you sort of take a look at, hey, this is a partial, so it must be a source generator behind the scenes. So it's a tricky one, but I'm not mad at this design. I do think it could be better. And actually in the issue that this topic was worked on, you can see that there's different approaches on how this could be done. And people like Damian Edwards have suggested some options that I actually quite like. So I wish the design shifts a bit to make it more developer friendly because now it is more, here's this, here's this. They sort of live in parallel. They can change independently, deal with it. You know, that sort of situation. In any case, this is a very cool feature that's coming and it's just another step into a fully native AOT able future. So I'm really glad they're adding it and I really want to see more. But now I want to know from you, what do you think about this and will you use it? Are you even using options validation in the first place? Because many people don't. Leave a comment down below and let me know. Well, that's all I have for you for this video. Thank you very much for watching and as always, keep coding.